Next, we'll describe distributions. Descriptive statistics are statistics that we use to describe quantitative variables in a population. And we use distributions, central tendency, and variability as ways of describing populations. Distributions are representations of a variable as a function of its frequency of occurrence, and that's shown on the graph on the right. For example, we have the variable of men's heights. Men's heights, although this is a continuous variable, can be broken down into categories for the purposes of describing its distribution. So we have men's heights subdivided into various bins, and those bins are ordered on the x-axis from short to tall. And on the y-axis, we have the number of individuals that fall within that bin or fall within that category and we have what looks to be a distribution with the majority of values falling someplace in the middle and tailing off on either side. It's important to feel comfortable with frequency histograms such as this because much of statistics is focused around the analysis of these types of frequency histograms. Distributions. Most continuous quantitative variables in natural populations assume what's called a normal or a Gaussian distribution. This represents the random variation around a central average value. And the graph shown on the right shows a very typical Gaussian or normal distribution. The idea is that out in the population, there is some mean value for some particular variable, but that there is natural variation amongst that mean such that most of the values fall near to the mean, and as you get further and further away in either direction, those values become less frequent. This gives the very frequently seen or frequently described bell-shaped curve shown on the right. We have several ways of describing distributions. Normal distributions can be described by calculating, first of all, the central tendency. One may want to know what is the average value in the distribution? And there are three different descriptors or statistics that we use to describe central tendency. We have the mean, the median, and the mode. Another point of description of a distribution is its variability. We may want to know how widely spread are the values in this distribution. And to do that, we can use something like the range or the standard deviation in a population. All of these values will be defined more precisely in the subsequent slides. The most common way of describing the central tendency of a distribution is the mean, often written as x bar, often just called the average. So the mean of a distribution is simply the sum of all the values in that distribution divided by the number of values. So an example is given in the next bullet point down with 15 people with a series of heights ranging from 63 inches up to 76 inches. If one wanted to compute the mean value, one would add up all of those values, and their sum is 1047, and then divide by the number of values, and there are 15 values. Therefore, the mean is 1047 divided by 15, or 69.8. Another way of describing this central tendency is the median. The median is the middle value in a set, i.e. the number that divides the set into two equal halves. So for example, in the data set provided, shown here in the second bullet point, ranging from 63 to 76, one would simply count up all the values, rank order them, and then pick the middle value. That middle value, in this case, is 69. Now, sometimes we're looking at distributions that aren't of an odd number, that is, of an even number. And in that case, you would take the halfway point between the two middle values and call that the median. So the median tells us that there are half the values that fall below that point and the other half of the values that fall above that point. Another measure of central tendency is the mode. The mode is the most frequently appearing value in the data set.
So for the data set shown in the second bullet point, ranging from 63 to 76, it's apparent that 66 appears three times, and no other individual value appears more than two times in the data set. Therefore, the modal value, or the mode, is 66. Now, in a normal distribution, or a Gaussian distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode all have the same value. However, we don't always have a normal or a Gaussian distribution to deal with. And what we know is that the mean value tends to be the most sensitive value to skewing of a distribution. So shown on the bottom is a distribution which is skewed towards a positive, meaning it is a distribution with a positive skew. If one were to compute the mode, the median, and the mean, you would find that the mean has the greatest value, the mode has the lowest value, and the median has an intermediate value. This is another way of demonstrating that the mean value is most sensitive to a skewing of the distribution. Conversely, if you had a distribution with a negative skew, the mean would have the lowest value, the median would have the intermediate value, and the mode would have the highest value. So, review. If you were given a distribution that was skewed as follows, what would be the median, what would be the mode, what would be the mean? Well, one easy way of doing this is simply remembering the following mnemonic. You start from the tail and you label them in alphabetical order. So, in this case, for this particular distribution, we have a distribution with a positive skew. That is, the tail is on the positive end. Therefore, the first metric of central tendency that we would encounter would be the mean that has the MEA beginning. The next would be the median that has the MED beginning. And then that would be followed by the mode, MOD. Thus, we use the alphabetical ordering of these words to help us remember. And again, another way of thinking about this is that the mean will always be most sensitive to the skewing, whereas the mode would be the least sensitive. Practice question. A group of pediatricians have proposed a plan to evaluate the relationship between serum mercury levels and autism. They begin with the assumption that serum mercury levels are evenly distributed throughout their proposed test population. Which of the following statements is most consistent with the above information? A. The median is greater than the mode. B. The median, the mean, excuse me, is greater than the mode. C. The mean is equal to the median. D, the mean is greater than the median, or E, the mode is greater than the mean. Well, in this question, they tell us that we have what they describe as an even distribution throughout their proposed test population. This is not a particularly specific word, but it implies that there is symmetry throughout that distribution. That is, there is not a skewing in one direction or another. Whenever a population is symmetric, whether it be a normal distribution or a uniform distribution, the mean, median, and modal values will all align and will be the same. So in this case, the correct answer is C. The mean is equal to the median. Central tendency. What if I gave you a set of data? Could you predict whether or not there's a skew? And if so, which direction? The answer is yes. So given the set of data as shown at the top bullet point, how would you know if there's a skew and how would you know its direction? Well, the most straightforward way of answering this question is to compute the mean, the median, and the mode. So that's shown for you here. The mean is 69.8, the median value is 69, and the mode is 66. Given these relationships, we can figure out whether or not there is a skew. So the first answer is yes, there is a skew, because if there were not, then the mean, the median, and the mode would have the same value. And we can order the mean, median, and mode to understand whether or not there's a positive or negative skew. Since the mean has the highest value and the mode has the lowest value, that means the mean is tracking most closely with the tail of the distribution. Since the tail of the distribution has a higher number than the mode, this would have a positive skew. So since we have a distribution with a positive skew, one might ask, 
well, how useful is the mean in this situation? And the answer is that when a distribution has a skew, whether it's positive or negative, and we know that the mean is going to be most sensitive to that skewing, we should use a metric which is less sensitive to that type of movement. And for that reason, typically, when a distribution is skewed, one utilizes the median value as the descriptor of the central tendency in that distribution. And that's demonstrated in the next slide. Here we have the mode median and mean shown for a positively skewed distribution. And generally speaking, in a skewed distribution, the median most closely represents the central tendency because the mean will always be pulled to the extreme values in a skewed distribution. The next major descriptor in a distribution is this distribution's variability. The most simple way of describing the variability of a distribution is its range. That's simply the span from the highest to the lowest values for a data set. So for the set shown in the second bullet point, the range would be 63 up to 76, and the difference then to comprise that whole range would be 13. One problem with the range is that the range can be very sensitive to outliers. If one had a population where 99% of the points fell within a fairly circumscribed range and a single point was far off from that central tendency, the range would not reflect the overall distribution of where those data points fall. The more common way of describing the variability in the population is using the standard deviation. The standard deviation is a measure of the average deviance of the individual values in the set from the mean. It's typically given the Greek lowercase letter sigma, and sigma equals the square root of the sum of the squares of all the differences of the individual values from the mean values divided by the number of values in the data set. So for the data set shown below, from the 63 ranging to 76, the standard deviation is 4.3. The greater the standard deviation, the greater the amount of variability in the data set. And the main advantage of the standard deviation over the range is that the standard deviation is not nearly as sensitive to outliers as the range is. We can take a closer look at this formula shown at the top. What can we learn from the formula? So the first question is, if we increase the sample size, does the standard deviation change? And the answer is no, or at least not necessarily. It might be tempting to say yes, because increasing the sample size would increase n. And by increasing that denominator, the value of sigma would go down. But increasing the sample size also adds another unit to be summed in the numerator of this expression. So simply increasing the number of samples will not necessarily decrease the standard deviation. It will decrease the standard error, since the standard error has as a numerator, excuse me, as a denominator, another term for n. How about changing the range? If we were to change the range, would the standard deviation change? And the answer is yes, because the standard deviation, its numerator is corresponding to the range, meaning the more variables deviate from the mean, the more, uh, the greater will be the standard deviation. How do we use standard deviation? Standard deviation is actually critically important because there are well understood relationships between the standard deviation and the number of subjects that fall within particular ranges in a normal distribution. Shown here at the bottom of the slide is a normal distribution and the percentage of subjects that fall within particular standard deviations away from the mean. So in a normal distribution, approximately 68% of all the values fall within one standard deviation of the mean. That's shown in red on the graph at the bottom. 95% of values fall within two standard deviations of the mean, and that's shown with the green bars on the bottom. And 99.7% of values fall within three standard deviations of the mean.
it's worth spending some time and making sure that you feel comfortable with these relationships. And these relationships should be committed to memory. So let's think about this further. If we look at this distribution, what do we know about some of these relationships? So we know that 68% of values fall within one standard deviation. Therefore, 34% of values are within one standard deviation above the mean, and 34% are within one standard deviation below the mean. If we also know that 95% of values fall within two standard deviations, that means that 47.5% of values are above the mean, but below two standard deviations above the mean, and that 47.5% of values are below the mean, but not further than two standard deviations below the mean. These relationships will be of very high importance as we sort through some of the upcoming questions. Practice question. When you take the USMLE Step 1 exam, the average score is 190 and the standard deviation is 20. If you score 210, what percentage of those taking the test received a lower score? Well, if you scored 210, that means that you scored exactly one standard deviation above the mean. And if you're one standard deviation above the mean, what does that imply in terms of the percentage of people who fell either above or below that number? Well, let's look at this next slide. Break up the distribution into multiple different pieces. We know that 50% of people will score below the mean. That's the definition of a normal distribution. So what is the slice that represents this area between the mean and one standard deviation above the mean? Well, as described previously, since we know that 68% of people fall plus or minus one standard deviation, that means 34% of people fall one standard deviation above the mean. We add up then these values, the 50% representing the lower half, and the 34% representing the number of people that fell between the mean and one standard deviation above the mean, that total percentage of people who fell in that range is 84%. Therefore, you, with your score of 210, scored greater than 84% of all people who took the exam at that time. So for those reasons, the correct answer is C, 84%. Practice question. A particular association determines membership on the basis of members' IQ scores. Only those persons who have documented IQ scores at least two standard deviations above the mean are eligible for admission. Out of 200 people randomly selected from the population, how many would be eligible for membership to the society? A1, B2, C3, D4, or E5? Well, this question falls back to understanding what percentages of people fall within what percent or within what number of standard deviations from the mean. Well, we know that 95% of individuals fall between two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below the mean. And they told us that we're looking for the population that fell two standard deviations above the mean or greater. Well, if 95% fell between two standard deviations above and two standard deviations below. That means that 5% of the population falls in those tails. Since the distribution is symmetric, that means that 2.5% fall below our range and 2.5% fall above the range. Therefore, 2.5% of people fall above two standard deviations from the mean. Since they've told us our total population number is 200, we simply multiply the percentage of people that we know fall within a particular range times the number of people that are tested, which is 200, and 200 times 2.5% is 5. The correct answer is E, 5. Practice question. As part of an effort to understand addiction to opiates, a psychiatrist develops a questionnaire to quantify different habits and behaviors that have been associated with psychological addiction. After interviewing 500 patients, it is determined that 95% of addicts score between 200 and 300 on the test. If a patient scored in the 16th percentile, 
what would his raw score be? A, 216, B, 225, C, 234, D, 250, or E, 300. In this question, the data are given in a slightly different format than in the previous questions. I think when looking at a question like this, one of the best practices you can get into is simply to draw out the distribution. If you draw the distribution, it makes it more clear where all the various values lie. So in the next slide, we've drawn out the distribution. So what do we know from what they've told you? They said that 95% of people fall between 200 and 300. Well, you know already that in a normal distribution, 95% of people fall within two standard deviations above or below the mean. That means that this 200 to 300 range corresponds to two standard deviations below and two standard deviations above the mean. And once you know that, you can draw your distribution out because you know what the standard deviation is. If the range between 200 and 300 represents the two above and two below the mean in terms of standard deviations, that means that the standard deviation must be 25 because two standard deviations below 250, which you know is the mean, is the midpoint of the range that was given. Two standard deviations below would give you 200 and two standard deviations above would give you 300. Once we know what the distribution looks like, then we can go back and figure out what they actually wanted us to figure out. So that's about the 16th percentile. So what does 16th percentile mean? That means what is the point in which 16% of the people scored below that point and 84% of the people scored above that point? Well, certain numbers should begin to click with you over time. When someone talks about 84% in a distribution, what they really are referring to is the 50% above the mean and then that 34% slice that falls between the mean and one standard deviation away from it. So what they're really asking you is, what is the value at the one standard deviation point below the mean? Because at that point, 16% of people fall below that value. Because again, 84% of people fall above that value. So the question is really asking, what is the value at one standard deviation below the mean? Well, if the standard deviation is 25 and the mean is 250, the value at one standard deviation below the mean is 225. Reason the correct answer to this question is B, 225. All right, this question. An 85-year-old man is being evaluated for hypotension in the emergency department after falling at home. Systolic blood pressure is measured six times over the course of several hours with a maximum value of 100 millimeters of mercury and a minimum value of 80 millimeters of mercury. If the next measurement is 160, which of the following will most likely occur? A, the mode would increase significantly. B, the mean would increase significantly. C, the median would increase significantly. D, the range wouldn't change. E, the standard deviation wouldn't change. Well, again, I think it's useful to think about what this question is really asking you. They say you have some data. You have six data points, and they are tightly clustered between 80 and 100. Your seventh data point is now 160. You have what looks like an outlier, and you should know already what is the effect of outliers on the descriptors of distributions. When looking at the central tendency of a distribution, an outlier will have its most sensitivity in moving the mean value, and the mode is least likely to move. He described this earlier when describing skewed distributions. Outliers will also have an effect on the range and the standard deviation. They'll affect both. Outliers have a greater effect on the range than the standard deviation, but both of these will change. So the correct answer here is B the mean would increase significantly. As mentioned before, the mean is most sensitive to outliers, more sensitive than mode or median, and both the range and standard deviation would change with the inclusion of this outlier. That concludes our discussion of distributions.